Well, he, you just took all of my good words, so thank you very much. You gave all the highlights away, the change, the hope, what am I, what's left? Uh, thank you very much for, uh, for coming tonight. Uh, I really appreciate it. Of course, this is uh, a timely skip, never gets things wrong, and so he planned this perfectly. He knew that State of the Union was going to be tomorrow night, but he planned this months ago. And uh, uh, so, of course, it's, uh, it's an appropriate time to be here, and hopefully we'll get into some of the questions afterwards and, and can talk a little bit about State of the Union addresses. Tonight, uh, I'm going to be talking mostly about President Obama's pre-presidential days and the speeches he gave and, and the rhetoric he used, and, and hopefully then afterwards we can chat about whatever you'd like. I also want to thank, uh, of course, the Clinton School of Public Service and Skip for having me here. I, I was just talking to Skip before, and I said, uh, I remember in the White House uh, that people were, when, when the President announced that he was going to do what he did with the the, with this building and with the library itself and, and, and develop the bridge, which I know is getting developed now, people said, are, are you crazy how much that's going to cost? It's going to drain Little Rock for every dime it ever had, and this thing will never work. Uh, then I heard recently there was some number about $2 billion of, of powers brought to the uh, community here and to developing North Little Rock, so congratulations. I mean, it's really a testament to, to all the work here that you're doing and everyone's work here, and, and so it's, it's an honor, really, to, to be here. So thank you. And uh, I had a chance to actually live in Little Rock during the Clark campaign. Uh, I, I never was here during the Clinton 92 campaign. I was uh, still a little young, but um, I got to do the second term uh, of, the, of the Clinton presidency. Uh, and so it's, it's like coming home. I got to work on the Clinton Library as well on some of the exhibits, only the ones that you like. And, um, uh, uh, and so that was a lot of fun. And uh, you, you can imagine getting a chance to, to inscribe some of the words that will I know, live on a long time was, it was a treat. Uh, you know, it's something about uh, the power in words that, that Barack Obama understood very early, and, and I know that Bill Clinton has always understood as well, that really words have a, have a chance to move you, whether it's to move you to get involved in public service, to move you to govern, to inspire you to vote for somebody, or to, uh, to have an own, your own call to action. Um, I, I think that this book, my goal here with this book was to talk to some of the speechwriters who had a chance to help President Obama on his journey during the campaign and to really uh, understand what was in their minds and when they wrote what they did. Um, uh, as I was working, uh, and I'll let this out early, I was working on Senator Clinton's campaign. I'm a Clinton person. You know, you have to support the Clintons if you're a Clinton person. And, um, uh, and I remember uh, thinking, in, in retrospect, I thought they had certain strategies uh, that they didn't. Uh, I thought they were really smart where it just was fortuitous. And then other places where I didn't realize what they were doing, after talking to them, I said, uh, that was pretty shrewd. Um, and uh, that's why we got beat. Uh, so uh, the journey that I had in pulling this together was, uh, was, uh, was a great time as someone who, who was a speechwriter in the White House and then someone who did campaigns. Uh, I got a chance to sit down with the writers and say, um, for these speeches, tell me what your favorite speeches are. What were the most important speeches? And why were they so important? And why were they the speeches that actually moved the country and elected uh, the first African American president in US history? Um, uh, you know, tomorrow night, we're going to see him in action. But we all remember, I think, pretty well the first time we met Barack Obama, that most Americans met Barack Obama, which was at the 2004 Democratic Convention. Um, before that, he was, he was running for U.S. Senate in Illinois and had beaten back, uh, had gotten some breaks in the primary and was going to win in the general. But no one really, I mean, if you look at his, his known rate, there was some polling of people who knew him that was very low. Uh, and then suddenly, in 2004, he takes center stage at the Democratic Convention. And if you remember, he says, uh, uh, there's no red states, blue states, there's only one, one country, United States of America. I just butchered it, but that was the idea. Um, um, and he talks about unity, and he introduces himself in his biography. Um, and he was refreshing in a country that had been so divided uh, and so much, uh, as we still see, so much uh, anger in our rhetoric. He sort of said, we're going to bring change to America. And overnight, he became a phenomenon. He was left the convention, he says, uh, uh, with people. He, he walked into the floor, no one knew who he was. He walked off the floor, and people were grabbing his cufflings off of him and, and grabbing at him, and they had to push people off because he was mobbed. And the next day, his old publisher called him, who had uh, published his first book, which came out 
soon after he left law school, uh, and it was long out of print, and they ordered 75,000 copies, um, which uh, are m more copies than uh, my book has. Um, <laughs> <laughs> just by a couple thousand. Um, uh, so they ordered 75,000 copies, and, uh, uh, and they sold out uh, within a matter of weeks. Um, and he's on the front page of Time and Newsweek. He was an instant overnight phen political democratic phenomenon, and it was never the same after that. Um, and, and so I, I know many of us remember that, and what that tells us all is something that he really understood very early, as I said, the power in words. He, he in his announcement speech uh, in Springfield, Illinois, went out to the feet from where Abraham Lincoln announced his presidential run. And he said, and he quoted Lincoln, and he paraphrased Lincoln, and said uh, that, that President Lincoln understood the power in words. Um, he, and, and Lincoln did. Of course, Lincoln's words and speeches were much briefer um, than uh, President Obama or than any modern president. Uh, we won't talk about Bill Clinton. Um, he liked, uh, you know, we, we all know that um, he's got a way uh, to, to, he knows how to talk. And, uh, but, but, President Obama also, uh, his, his uh, announcement speech was 2,400 words, but interestingly, Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, uh, which we all had to read in school growing up, was only 278 words. His second inaugural, another very famous speech in history, was only 703 words. I mean, one of them is inscribed, as you know, in the Lincoln Memorial. Uh, uh, could you imagine trying to get a president in today's speech into the Lincoln Memorial? Um, you know, President Obama gave uh, I think one of the best speeches of his presidency was that last week or the week before when he went to uh, Arizona. Uh, and that speech was, I think, 30 minutes long or 28 minutes long. It just gives you a sense of, of, um, of how, how rhetoric has changed. Of course, Lincoln wrote his out by hand uh, on long pieces of sort of, uh, you know, it looks like almost cardboard he used to write. He used to keep them next to his, his bedside and, and next to his couch uh, where he used to sit in the parlor and he would write in, in longhand. Um, so you know, if he had to do it himself, you might imagine he would keep it short. Uh, I didn't have any of us to help him. Um, uh, but, but it was such a, different, such a different time. And presidential campaigns have also changed remarkably over time. The, uh, you know, this idea of direct democracy, which we are living in in a way today than is different than even when Bill Clinton was president, is, is a 24-hour, Seven day a week news cycle. Um, if you're on Facebook, uh, it's it's certainly uh, 20, uh, probably 25 hours a day. Um, there's so much coming at you, so many people sharing links, their thoughts, their blogging. Um, think about how the environment has changed so much. Um, and if you're running for president in a place like in a space like that, keeping up and filling the airwaves with so much rhetoric is is a real challenge and doing so in, with stuff that people remember, um, right? I mean, George Washington used to give, when he was president, an average of three speeches a year. That's it, three speeches a year. And, and many of the early forefathers, they only, they gave less than 10. Andrew Jackson was uh, seen as one of the great early communicators. On average, he gave 10 speeches a year. Um, it was seen early on as, uh, you know, we, we, we were very sensitive of being, the presidents as being seen as, as taking on monarchical tendencies, and so that was a big concern after the Revolutionary War. And people were illiterate, and so there was either you were going to read the speech because there was, there was no radio or, or internet. Um, so if you wanted to hear them, you had to read about it in the newspaper, read what they wrote. Um, George Washington's uh, farewell address was written by Hamilton, um, and uh, the, one of the earliest, the earliest speechwriter was written by Hamilton, and uh, it was never actually spoken. He never uttered it. It was written in the newspaper, and only a very small percentage of America actually got to read it because they couldn't read. And you have to depend on word of mouth, and that was all you had. So the art of speech writing has changed, and, and Woodrow Wilson, actually speaking of State of the Unions, Woodrow Wilson decides uh, in, in, uh, in to give up uh, what had been a long tradition on State of the Union, which was just sort of sending the president, uh, sort of sending Congress, as the Constitution requires, the State of the Union. Um, so Wilson says, wait a second here, there's this great opportunity for me to talk to the people. Why am, why am I giving this up? And, 
And he is, so he goes to Congress and delivers it, and they heckle him for it in the paper for days leading up to it. You know, King George, um, how dare he misuse his throne. Um, and then it's a huge success. Um, and no one ever said a word about it after, <laughs> from, from either party. Uh, then Teddy Roosevelt coins that phrase we all know, the bully pulpit. Um, he said he could bully Congress from his pulpit, um, and he did. He bullied Congress into enacting his agenda. Um, and then in 1932, FDR goes and becomes the first uh, nominee to actually go accept, just, uh, just like, uh, all, just like uh, Obama did in, in, uh, in Colorado, to accept the nomination after your party n nominated him. Before that, most presidents said, you know, who little old me, oh, if you want me to serve, okay, come knock on my door. And so you'd have the, the party bosses nominate the person, they'd come out to his house, and um, this is sort of Jeffersonian democracy at its finest, and they'd you know, say, please, I know you're enjoying your time here but on the, on the farm, but would you come serve? And he'd say, oh, I guess so, I, if the country wants me to. So now, of course, um, this all changes. Uh, and Roosevelt shows up and, he, and in person he says, uh, I think it's a great line, he said, the appearance before a national convention of its nominee for president is unprecedented and unusual, but these are unprecedented and unusual times. My friends, may this be the symbol of my intention to be honest and to avoid all hypocrisy or sham, to avoid all silly shutting of the eyes of truth in this campaign. You have nominated me and I know it and I am here to thank you for the honor. Uh, again, they criticized him before. He left and everybody, Democrat or Republican, got in line and did exactly the same thing thereafter. It was a brilliant move uh, and Barack Obama has him to thank for starting this tradition because that's where he got his start in the 2004 campaign. You know, FDR, as we all know, uh, sold his new deal over the radio and, and moved the country. JFK was the first to really use TV uh, and we remember that from the campaign against Nixon, the famous debate. Uh, and then Bill Clinton is the first modern president in the true 24-hour news cycle. CNN comes up during his time, and every time the president went out, whether it was going out to the Rose Garden to, to shake hands with uh, the Boys, Boys Nation or, uh, or no matter where he was, it became a national event, and you had 20 cameras capturing you. There was no hiding. And so the modern presidency is born, and people like me, uh, we suddenly had a job. Um, uh, you know, it, it's interesting, Ted Sorensen, who, who just passed away recently, was, was JFK's famous speechwriter, and it was really just Ted Sorensen, um, but JFK only gave uh, an average of about 200 speeches a year, about 150 speeches a year, depending upon the year. Um, and uh, so, of course, Ted, when he, I remember him having lunch with us, and there was about seven of us, I think, speechwriters, and he'd say, I just don't understand, you know, I'd walk uphill both ways to the White House, and there's just me. <laughs> I don't know why there's so many around, of you around the table. And then we'd say, yes, but, but Ted, you, you would only had to write 150 a year, and Bill Clinton was giving about 550 public speeches a year. Um, and Ronald Reagan, who was the great communicator, gave about 350, just to show you the difference. And Harry Truman, uh, Truman, scholar, Harry Truman gave an average of 88 a year. So you see the massive explosion of why these words have changed and why you have to produce so much to fill, which why it makes it incredible when somebody like Barack Obama comes up during the campaign and despite all of this noise, he's able to grab your attention. Um, and some people say, well, it's harder when he's president. Uh, you know, I don't know as many speeches that he gives. He's still giving good speeches. Reporters call all the time and ask this question. You know, he just must not be giving good speeches anymore. Well, not at all. His speeches are still excellent. Um, we saw that in Arizona a couple weeks ago. It's just you're back to your daily lives and there's so much noise. Uh, it's, it's really hard to break through. And we poor presidential speechwriters um, have the job of, of trying to help figure out a way to break through. Um, Judson Welliver was the first uh, official presidential speechwriter. Um, he worked for Harding. Um, so we don't remember much about President Harding's presidency. Um, but, but his speechwriter came up with this term called founding fathers which we all know. That was his speechwriter. Um, uh, and I mentioned Sorensen and, and John Favreau, who is President Obama's uh, chief speechwriter. Uh, and, and like Sorensen, who actually met, Ted Ken I mean, met John Kennedy when he was in the Senate. He was the junior senator from Massachusetts. And young Ted Sorensen 
meets him and, and he starts his policy aid and, and John Kennedy, Senator John Kennedy says, would you join me? And he joins him and he's with him until he's assassinated with him the whole time. Um, John Favreau uh, actually worked with me on the John Kerry campaign in 2004 and then um, John Kerry uh, loses and says, and, and John Favreau is deciding what to do. And he saw Barack Obama give this speech at the 2004 convention and said, I, I want to work for that guy. I mean, why wouldn't you? This, I mean, right? I mean, when someone gives a great speech, you want to work for him as a speechwriter. So he, he says, uh, so he, he, he interviews for the job. Um, and you know, it's a little tough because Barack Obama is a writer. You know, as, as I mentioned, he's written a couple books. Um, it makes it difficult. The bar is high for Barack Obama. But they hit it off uh, quickly. It took a few uh, all-nighters and uh, a few sessions in, in the senator's uh, study where, where Barack Obama would just dictate and download uh, speeches. And, and Favre, he and Favreau would go back and forth. And there was this bond that was born similar to the kennedy Sorensen bond. Uh, Favreau is an incredibly strong writer. Um, and, and on the campaign trail, when the campaign starts, they continue to have this relationship, um, this really strong, strong bond. Uh, and it was, you know, you, you know, I asked John, because he told me all these great stories, you know, how did you know what he wanted here? And he said, well, of course, I just know what he's going to say. I'm, I've, after seven years, I've, in some ways, become him, right? I mean, that's the job of the speechwriter. You learn how to, to speak for him. And so from the road, what would happen during the campaign, which was a great process, candidate Obama would be out in the field, and Favreau and the other speechwriters, there were five of them, would be in their campaign office. They were in this hold up, in this, penned up in this office. And they wrote often as a group, a couple of them sitting behind the, behind the computer at a time, testing lines on one another, pulling all-nighters uh, several times a week, as they, as they reminded me, um, and drinking lots of Red Bull and eating lots of pizza. Um, so some things uh, never change. Uh, um, so lots of coffee and, and, and surviving. And they would send Barack Obama the speech out in the road. And Barack Obama was the first president that I could figure out, first candidate, that actually carried a laptop with the wireless card. And he would download and redline on Microsoft Word his speeches. And he would actually write them and send them back. Uh, and send them back. And often his aide, a gentleman named Reggie Love, who is the, the president's uh, per, still his personal aide, he would uh, grab Reggie's Blackberry, and he would just type a note to Favreau and the guys. He'd say, this is Barack. And then he'd say, well, here's what I think. You should move this around, move this around. He was very engaged uh, in his rhetoric. Um, uh, and his rhetoric is not, the rhetoric he used throughout his presidential campaign was not new. It was, it was, it was stuff he'd been saying, interestingly, going back to the State House. Because uh, I remember saying to, to John Favreau, how did you come up with this? Or how did you come up with that? Why did you say that? And he said, I'm always asked that. Go back and look at what he said in 2002. Go back and look at what he said in 2000. He'd been saying the same stuff over and over again. Change, whether it was changing Illinois or changing Washington. You know, getting rid of lobbyists. He'd been saying that forever. Hope, he'd been talking about hope for a long time in one way or another. And he talked a lot about responsibility, which is a theme we see coming back now, interestingly. And for those Clinton fans who, if you remember, it was Opportunity, Responsibility, Community, we're seeing these themes come back. Um, um, and responsibility uh, is an interesting one that fell off his first two years. I remember talking, saying, where did responsibility go? You used to talk about this all the time, whether it was families or your father's responsibility or your responsibility to your community or your church. I said, what happened to that? And he said, yeah, no, I know we lost, we lost responsibility. Um, and so after the election, last cycle's election, you actually saw Obama go out, President Obama go out, and he talked a lot about, you should go read his speech, he talked a lot about responsibility, um, which is a very centrist way of talking. Um, so I think you're, you're seeing some of that come out. You also remember what was great about Obama was his, his style. He was like, like Reagan, he was, he was a great communicator. Obama had his own great communication style. You know, he was often best at a podium. Um, I think he was taller than I was, but he could see over the podium better. But, but he had the, he had the glasses up and uh, he was doing his teleprompters. He would speak to large audiences, of tens of thousands of people, and it was electric. If you ever been, if you ever got a chance to go to one of those events or watch it on TV, you felt the way he connected. He had uh, sort of the cadence of a black preacher often in these speeches, and where you sort of you start slow, you rise up, and then you come back down. Um, he, he, he really knew how to do that well, and, and uh, often can still uh, at campaign events you'll you'll still see him do it. Um, and he was, he was 
unlike actually Bill Clinton or George Bush even, who were better in sometimes smaller audiences, his real strength, Barack Obama's real strength, is the big audience. It's why you see him during the campaigns really like to do those. It's where he, where he tends to be best. Um, he also has a tendency, and it's one thing we saw in his first two years, to speak a little bit professorial. Um, if, if, uh, right, all you were shaking your head because we all saw him fall into this problem. He used to do this a lot early in his career. And Abner Mikva, Mikva who actually was printed, uh, appointed by Bill Clinton, who was very close to Barack Obama as a, Chicago, a fellow Chicago uh, Paul, Mikva said, uh, he said, listen, I'm gonna give you advice that I heard given to Senator John Kennedy. Jack, you have to learn to speak more Irish and less Harvard. <laughs> and I think um, that sometimes is exactly the same idea that President Obama can fall into those traps. And, and you see his staff trying to really break him, break him free from, from that. Um, um, this, this hope and change idea also let, you know, if you're speaking about hope and change, it lets you actually lift yourself up in front of a large audience. It, it's just inspiring. You, you see him, but you actually would see him bounce. If you watch his feet, he's actually always standing up and lifting himself up like in, in, in the cadence. Um, um, and talking about hope and change, he, he, when he ran for Congress, which was his only race that he ever lost, um, he said, uh, uh, I have no fancy sponsors. I'm not even from Chicago. My name is Obama. Nobody sent me. I'm not part of some long-standing political organization. I want to inspire a renewal of morality in politics. Um, and so he, uh, he, you see him really early talking about, as I mentioned, those themes. And then we go, and, and I'll sort of, sort of end some of what I'm talking about here, about some of his speeches from the campaign, which, which we remember. Um, there was, of course, his famous Iraq War Resolution speech in 2002 which differentiated him from, from Senator, then Senator Clinton and from then Senator John Edwards, who, were both, who had both voted for the war. And if you remember, this was a big, a big moment uh, in, and a big differentiator early on. It inspired, uh, inspired you, we were talking about it before, and, and sort of helped get a lot of people online uh, to, that was the best way to get to the net roots, the grassroots, was the anti-war position, and it really grabbed a lot of people. Um, he, uh, another famous speech is the 2004 convention speech, which we talked about, um, um, and I had the line that I butchered before, there is no liberal America and a conservative America, there is the United States of America. He talked about values, he said, we are our brother's keeper, we are our sister's keeper. Um, again, this idea of responsibility, and this is how, how he used it. Um, uh, then he gave his, another big moment, his famous race speech, which we all, uh, hopefully remember because it was a turning point in the campaign. Reverend Wright had been all over the television screens and all over the internet and Reverend Wright said to him, and, and he said to his staff, this is gonna take me down if I don't stop this and stop it now. Um, and so he tells David Axelrod, his chief aide, he says, call Favreau and tell him I gotta give a speech tomorrow in Philadelphia. My presidency's on the line. No pressure. Um, <laughs> So he, he calls John, so Axelrod says, okay, start writing. Calls Favreau, says, start writing. Favreau says, no, 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 uh, sir, I, 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 really, I need to talk to, to Senator Obama. This is a very deeply personal thing. Uh, I'm a white guy from outside Boston. You know, this is not gonna work. <laughs> so he uh, calls him up and, and John Favreau had just moved into a new group house outside with a bunch of campaign aides in Chicago. And he doesn't even have furniture yet. So he's got a lamp and plugged into the wall and, and, uh, and he's, Obama calls him. And um, the other piece I'll tell you is that it's St. Patty's Day, uh, to add to that. So all his friends are out, um, you know, just sampling, uh, uh, you know, having a beer. Um, and uh, he's sitting in, his, in the house alone, waiting for Senator Obama to call. Obama calls, and uh, he downloads for an hour and a half straight, because he's been thinking about this. This is a very personal thing. And he downloads to him, and. Favreau's typing as fast as he can, typing, typing, typing on his laptop to try to capture it all. And he said, okay, I need this by tomorrow. It's now around 10 p.m. I need this tomorrow at 3 p.m. I need a draft. And, you know, as I said to Axelrod, no pressure, but this is it. This is one of those moments. Presidency's on the line. Um, and, you know, I think any speechwriter or anybody in that moment would do what you do, right? I mean, of course, some would, would pull an all-nighter, and, and John, you know, went immediately closed his laptop and went to the bar and started the next morning at seven o'clock. Um, uh, and I don't, I don't blame him. I would have needed a stiff drink uh, after that as well. 
the, the lastly, the, the Iowa caucus was a, a pivotal moment. If, if, if those of you remember, it was uh, no one knew what was going to happen in Iowa. Uh, Senator Clinton came in third, Edwards came in second, and um, uh, Barack Obama came in first and out of nowhere. Um, and he gave this, he went and had a podium style speech with people behind him as a backdrop and gave this huge, uh, hugely memorable uh, moment uh, in, in where people who hadn't met him in the presidential cycle saw him and met him during prime time. And, and he, no one ever caught up after that. Senator Clinton won New Hampshire uh, the following week. If you remember, it surprisingly came back in New Hampshire. But even then, um, uh, uh, which is an interesting story, I said to them, well, how did you, did you think you were going to win New Hampshire? We thought you were going to win on Hillary Clinton's campaign. We thought you were definitely going to win. And he said, oh, no, no, we, we were up 10 points in our polls. We thought you were going to, we were definitely going to win. Um, I said, so what did you do? He said, well, it appeared about t 20 minutes before the end that we were going to lose. So we just gave the same speech and just congratulated Senator Clinton in the first line. They congratulated him. So they didn't even write a speech, a losing speech. And everybody in the press said, God, it was brilliant. It was like he didn't even acknowledge the fact that he lost. Well, right, because he didn't write the speech. Um, um, whereas in Iowa, you know, he said, uh, if you remember, uh, they said this day would never come. You know, it was sort of, uh, uh, and that was the beginning, uh, the beginning toward the end. You know, you, uh, the, and the, the Iowa JJ speech a month later is where he, he first starts to uh, differentiate himself publicly to, uh, sorry, a couple weeks earlier, starts to differentiate himself publicly to Hillary Clinton and starts attacking her and saying, she's Washington, she's the establishment, I'm change. And you have these, you have uh, polar opposites set up and that's what they're running on, change versus hope versus more of the same. And the more of the same was not the right message when most of the country's angry about where, the, about where they are, they're angry at their president, the economy's not doing well, and he symbolizes the new beginning and change. And he used his words to let the country know okay, change is coming to America. And, uh, and that's exactly what happened, and that's exactly what I talk about in my book. Is that long enough? <laughs> Thanks, Josh. So let's throw it open to questions. Somebody, anybody got a question out there? Yes, Annie, wait for the mic, please. First, I want to compliment you. You're the first speaker that I've seen that skip. I could read his face as you went through it. Usually he has a stone face. I paid him a lot you, of money to do that. You got him. The thing what I wanted to say and I wanted to ask you, my philosophy has been that I do believe in the power of words, is that the reason why Barack, and I was in that audience when he made that, and I did have to sign up when nobody else did, that, went around the world, is that you catch that kind of a phrase when it's self-defining. If you can put together two words, three words, one word that is so self-defining that the masses, the grassroots, understand it, nobody has to interpret it to them, that's what makes the power of words. Do you agree? That to me, sorry, Skip. That to me is a, a brilliant uh, order, makes for a brilliant order, and for a brilliant message deliverer. If you can get it down, because if I asked you the same question about Hillary Clinton, uh, I bet we'd find uh, we'd have a much harder time telling, uh, figuring out what that word was. Um, uh, anybody know, by the way? What was her? What was the key word in her campaign that she decided was going to differentiate herself? Ex uh, experience. If you remember, she was the experienced candidate, and he was the change candidate. And, and they were saying he can't be in the White House because he has no experience. He was just a state senator. Right? So, and people said, I don't, want, I don't want experience right now. I want something different. Um, and he's got plenty of experience. Once the campaign actually became uh, a symbol of his experience, right? Because he was doing well in the campaign. And, and what happened, I remember looking at our, our own polls, the experience tracker, the importance of experience kept going down as a differentiator as he kept doing well. Because people said, well, 
he's obviously got plenty of experience, otherwise he wouldn't be running this brilliant presidential campaign. And uh, it was a disaster for, and then they, they tried to become uh, the change candidate too and said it's our kind of change. Other questions? Let me ask one, Josh. What I read today about the State of the Union, and people say it really doesn't move the polls one way or the other. I mean, maybe a couple points that it really, unlike campaign speeches, or even like the Tucson speech. Do you talk about that? I mean, is sure. the State of the Union a political movement speech? Well, sometimes it, it's um, you know, 50 million people will watch the State of the Union, somewhere between 48 and 52 million. It's the Super Bowl of political campaign speeches. I'm sorry, of political speeches, right? It's, it's often the one time every year where people say, okay, I'll, I'll watch him give his State of the Union address. Um, some pageantry about it is what attracts people or this is their moment to check in. Um, I think this one will because he, what you've seen in the last, since the election in November, he has started to um, uh, change the way he's talking, the language he's using, the policies he's supporting. Um, they are, you know, some would say, more centrist, more moderate. Um, he's put, he, uh, he's sending, he's going back to unity with the Republicans who just shellacked him, as he said, right? So, um, I think this will. He's going to, I believe, hammer that home more tomorrow night, and people are going to see that. And those who had abandoned him, which they did in droves before the midterms, his numbers were, were really trailing. I think a lot of more people are going to come back. And the speech he did in Arizona, he got a huge bump off between the tax plan. And that speech in Arizona, he's back above 50. He's like 54. He was at 46. He's picked up 10, 11 points of favorability, uh, which is, which, you know, no one since Bill Clinton has done that, that effectively. And Bill Clinton, if you remember, after Oklahoma City, that was a big moment for him. He had the, the, sort of the week before Oklahoma City, he said, uh, he sort of said, I'm, uh, the presidency has lost its power. Um, and then he gives Oklahoma City, and, um, which was only eight minutes, interestingly. And, and changes the momentum. And then, he's, and then he boxed Newt Gingrich in um, on some of his policies who tried to shut down government, and his whole presidency changed in a matter of weeks. Um, and so I think it's a, it could be a little what's happening here. Do you think it will be, do you think it will be, um, have more of an impact because of this Democrats, Republicans sitting together and the drama of, of all that stuff? Does that impact how he acts? I don't know, what do you all think? Do you buy that? Is it gimmick? Too gimmicky? Yeah. I don't know if they said no. <laughs> how, many, true, how many of you all besides Denver have ever written the State of the Union speech? <laughs> Any other questions? But it, it's a, but skip to just your point. It's a really good question. These, the gimmick stuff sometimes is really effective. Yeah. Uh, Ronald Reagan was the first one to use the First Lady's box. If you ever see it during the State of the Union, he'll point and say, you know, Admiral so-and-so is here, or some woman who's here who just, who just lost her husband in war, and it's a really moving moment. That, Ronald Reagan started that, which was masterful, and then that st state of the, the, the uh, first lady's box is what it's called, has become, uh, at least it was during the Clinton years, was a months long process of deciding who would be in the box, and what they represented, and you put out stories about who was in the box, and people, they would be on TV, um, it, be, it was a whole, and that gimmick, uh, if, it's basically a gimmick. That gimmick was actually often very effective. And I saw where Obama announced that Daniel Hernandez and a couple others from Tucson are going to be there. Clinton had Rosa Parks. Rosa one Parks. Yeah. I remember. Yeah. Okay, question in the back. Yes. Um, you brought up the Oklahoma speech, and I remember that being such a somber kind of, you know, obviously we'd been attacked. In Tucson, the audience was so raucous and kind of a, and I and I really was amazed at that. And then I watched because I hoped that people would hear what President Obama had to say because I know he can say it so well. But did you think that he tempered the crowd or did he live off that? Did he get more? Such a good point you're making because I, I had uh, a very similar reaction and not knowing, uh, I sort of said this is. They were selling buttons and T-shirts. I said, "This is, you know, sort of tawdry, unseemly. This, well, uh, this, this can't work." And you saw, actually, if you watched President Obama, he never, ever, for a moment, uh, at least from what I remember, became part of that. He kept himself. He said, "He said, I'm going to be somber, right?" Um, and um, and so, therefore, I think he sort of was able to snake his way through it. 
But that, if he had joined in, I, I, you know, I thought that would have, it would have clearly gone the wrong way for him. Um, it was interesting also, he, he didn't get it. He had one line of policy in that speech where he talked about gun control, and it was, it was literally one sentence. You got a feeling that some aide shoved it in there in the last minute that he didn't want to do it, but there was some policy debate, I'm sure, that happened. But he's kept overall much higher, right? He talked about people, um, and, uh, uh, and, and, and we call them in, in presidential speech writing real people, the people, and paint a picture of, of who they are and their families. We, uh, right? I mean, we all, if you watch that speech, that was certainly one of the highlights, right? I mean, it was a tearjerker. Yes, ma'am, right here. I know we're talking about Obama, but I'd like to flip the coin and I'd like to ask about Sarah Palin. Uh, how is she able to uh, communicate when in fact she, she did bad in the interviews, you know, on TV? How can she be able to help other candidates to win with her speeches and her endorsements? Because she is, uh, you know, someone just screamed out hate speech. I mean, the, the part of it's what she's talking about and, and how she's, you know, the substance of what she's talking about. But actually, if you remember some of her early stuff when she first got a, first went to the convention floor and accepted the nomination, she was, I thought, quite persuasive. She was folksy and felt really down to earth. It's the difference between, it was, I mean, George Bush won in 2000, again in 04, because I think in part he, people wanted to have a beer with him. He was a grounded, uh, right, grounded uh, in the language he used. He, he didn't try to use, as Bill Clinton used to say, nickel and dime words. He didn't. And I think Sarah Palin, you know, has had at least uh, I don't watch her stuff as much anymore, but but really had that in, in 04 for a while, and then of course she did these interviews, which then uh, some of the substance caused her some problems. But her style was aw shucks, I'm one of you. You know, people relate to that. Yes, uh, Daniel. Oh, sorry. I'll be louder. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, thank you for. Uh, coming and speaking tonight, it was really interesting. My name is Nathaniel Owen. I'm a Clinton School student here. Uh, my question has to do with uh, articulating a, a governing philosophy. You know, this is something that President Reagan was uh, the master at. You know, actually using his ability to communicate to articulate a vision of government that was far different than had been accepted previously. Uh, you know, President Obama has spent his first two years kind of dealing with crises and just jumping from uh, different situations to try to just save the, <laughs> the economy. Do you think going forward he's going to have to do a better job of actually using his ability to communicate to articulate a clear governing philosophy? Uh, I'm not sure if he'll do the philosophy part, but the message part, I think you've already seen that in the last couple months. Jobs, 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 jobs. He knows that if he has to win, assuming the economy is still struggling, even if it's getting better, which it is, signs show that it's getting better, he, he has to put the perception out there that it is getting better, even if it's slower than people want. People, he, and this is an old uh, Bill Clinton trick, not to draw on Bill Clinton, but I feel like we have to here. Um, Clinton always said to us, you must communicate to people that tomorrow is better than today. If they feel that tomorrow is better than today, and you give them confidence. You, it's the it's the best way. You got it. Your job is to give them hope, right? I think in the first two years there was a little. They got lost on their messaging. It wasn't enough about jobs. They were doing health care and other things, and um, they had other distractions like the oil spill. There wasn't enough hammering about jobs, jobs, and jobs. And I think they're doing that now. And if he continues to do that, which I think you're going to see tomorrow night, he's already said tomorrow night's about American competitiveness, in innovation, investment, jobs. Those are all pretty, you know, the language is pretty centrist. It's pretty, con you know, even conservative in some of what he's saying. So I think that's what you're going to hear a lot more of, if that answers. Thanks for uh, the question. Question. Yes, ma'am, right here. We'll get the microphone to you. Back to the speech in Arizona, the event in Arizona. Yeah. Uh, you just mentioned the hope and the feeling. Uh, I guess I was the only one that had the feeling that the people in Arizona we're feeling hope, and that's why the jubilation, the applause, and everything. Because even though some got killed, the, in my opinion, they were celebrating the fact that a lot of them had lived, and especially their congresswoman. So I saw it as they are going, they're celebrating the life 
the lives that were that was this saved. is why you're much better at this than I am because no 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 <laughs> you were actually right because a lot of the I, my my reaction was was the opposite while it was going on and then when they talked to people afterwards and said didn't you if you watch some of the coverage on this didn't you feel uh, as I described that it was inappropriate and most of them said what well, you said which is no actually I was hopeful about Congresswoman surviving, and I was hopeful about our community and about our future. And these things happened, but we celebrated their lives. Um, you know, which is always the way you want to go out, is right with people celebrating you. And I, I think um, um, so. You're right. I mean, that's ultimately what happened. And I think that's ultimately why it worked. Um, but I know a lot of people said, "Whoa, whoa!" Said, "Whoa, this this might not be the right tactic." <laughs> yeah. Good question. Asked, right up here. Thank you Bill, for the question. Right. Hi. Uh, well, I appreciate you coming over here, and thanks, Skip. You always have wonderful speakers coming to Little Rock. Uh, my uh, impression of what happened in Tucson also, I think, had to do with the, uh, the bringing the hope issue about the problems with the immigration that we've had because of, of the governor there. and. Uh, I think the president was able to voice uh, hope in that regard. Um, I wonder if you think that he will uh, use or try to do anything about immigration in the next couple of years, or would that be something that would get, be abandoned because of the risk involved? And you think he will get reelected? It's a great question, and uh, I wish I knew the answer. I, I, um, um, it's a as you know, a very thorny issue, and uh, politicians have tried and not gotten where they want to get on the issue, but despite how important it is to address. Um, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's, I, I, my gut tells me that it depends how he does in the, in the months ahead. The more political capital he has, the more he'll be willing to take on some tough issues. Um, uh, the less he'll be focused on, uh, if, it, if it doesn't turn the way he wants it, he'll just keep hammering jobs, jobs, and jobs. I mean, at, from a messaging standpoint, you'd say to him, be very careful, don't pick on, you can't pick up too many things, right? Because uh, he can walk and chew gum at the same time, but only so much. And the country only has so much attention, and Congress only has so much attention. Um, um, so uh, I will see. It's a, it's a really it's a, it's an interesting and important issue that many presidents have failed miserably taking up. It's time for one more question right here. During the last campaign, I purposely did not watch uh, President Obama but read his speeches the next day because I found him to be so per persuasive. My question is, will we ever have politicians in the future like Hubert Humphrey, who was a well-intentioned, brilliant man with a horrible speaking voice? Do we have any chance, I mean, ha has that part of our population that cannot present just been written off? You know, it's a question that, well, it's a question that's, that was for you. I spoke louder. Um, it's a question that's that's been brought up uh, a lot, uh, and always does in the cycle. And now we're going into that presidential cycle again, when the Republicans will try to figure out who they can, who they're going to put up. You know, because of television and because of the internet and because of image, the power of the images, it's hard now, right, to have somebody who isn't necessarily um, um, telegenic that way, or who doesn't, who isn't a great communicator. Um, uh, it makes it it makes it challenging uh, in this in this day and age. I don't know. I mean, I, I think early on, if you would ask, Lincoln apparently didn't wasn't um, uh, if, if we graded him just on his ability from the stump to deliver a speech, he probably wouldn't have wouldn't have succeeded. Please. My great grandmother, who was 101 when she died, met Abraham Lincoln. Really? When she was five years old, I said, "What do you remember about him?" And she said. He had a very squeaky voice. <laughs> really? Can I use that? <laughs> Thank you. That's a great point. And it's one we'll, we'll see. I mean, I, I think uh, it's it's the, that's why you read these. That's why reading them is just so much different than watching them. Um, and I, it's really interesting that you took that approach. I think it's uh, very few do it, and they have a whole different perspective. If you remember during the Nixon Kennedy debates. Right. The Nixon-Kennedy debates, people who listened on the radio had a much different reaction than those who watched Nick uh, Kennedy on TV. 